Hey guys, welcome to the Drama Club. On this week's episode, May and I finally introduce ourselves. Hi! <laughs> and we talk about John Cena not understanding common law marriage in California. May tells us the story of Monica Lewinsky getting her presidential knee pads. I jump into a story of George Michael mistaking a public bathroom for a disco. And uh, we top it off with uh, George Michael's ex. Is it considered ex? Wi- widow. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> George Michael's boyfriend won't get a job. Stay tuned. What up, fam? What up, fam? It's good, y'all. Feels good, right? Woo, right? <laughs> yeah, I know it, dude. I yeah. know it, dude. And without further ado, uh, we broadcast a live. All right, so uh, our Twitter homegirl, Lorelai, pointed out to us that we've never introduced ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe we did at some point. Maybe it's in our last episode. No, I think that we're just like, okay, Steph is going to talk about this and May is going to talk about that. But we never like take a chance in the beginning to like actually say who the fuck is who. And That's true. I never thought to do it because I know who I am. <laughs> But do you know who I am? Yes. <laughs> I'm Stephanie. And I'm May. And together, we're we the Drama, Drama Club. Club. <laughs> <laughs> together, we're one person. A second part of our intro, uh, we're, we're friends. And we like, <laughs> things, we like things that are scandalous and or dramatic. And, and that's we, why we, we decided to start this podcast. Yeah, and we both love TV and movies. And we like celebrities. And we live for celebrity gossip. Yeah, so um, this was only natural. Yeah, <laughs> it was natural to introduce ourselves like eight podcasts in, <laughs> eight episodes in. Well, I like to think that people already know us now. Oh, yeah, now. Me too. But don't call uh, me for free legal advice. <laughs> don't be a dick. Hashtag don't be a dick. Hashtag don't be a dick. Okay, um, our hot topic this week is John Cena and Nikki Bella have broken up. You know, I got to give it to you, Steph. This is another case of exactly what you were saying. Was it last week? Shut up, man. Why why did this woman not become more famous? That's why her marriage broke up. (laughs) They're not married. They're like weeks away from being married. Oh, that's so tragic. They're calling off their wedding. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand good for them to like realize you know before getting in even deeper but on the other hand like fuck it must have been yeah that's a hard decision that's so crazy because you gotta like pull back all those invitations like you literally have to let everybody know it, it was a destination wedding too it was mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i don't know where so they've been dating since 2012 actually i think that he was way f- like famous when they started dating because people who are into wrestling like fucking love this guy Oh, sure, but he's way more famous now. Like, now he's in actual movies and shit. Yeah, that's true. Very true, very true. Yeah, so they started dating 2012, and that she's also a wrestler in WWE, but she is also part of the uh, Total Divas show on E! Um, and in that show, she's always, like, with him. Um, like, they chronicle their their relationship, and... Straight off the bat, like on the first season, I watched it for a while because, you know, I love trashy uh, reality (laughs) TV shows. Yeah. And he is always like, he kind of like seems to keep her at arm's length. Like he's been married before. I don't know if he has children, but Mm -hmm. he has stated that he never wanted to get married again. Like he would always bring that up with her because it's something that she wanted and something that he didn't. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I would always be weary of the guy that, asked me to marry him after saying he would never get married again yeah exactly yeah so and he like famously made her sign this like 75 page contract when they fucking i'm moved sorry in what together. yeah 75 page contract when they moved in together what yes what 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 yes <laughs> what what's in this what's in this contract so allegedly it's like it has to do with like <laughs> protecting his assets as well as like protecting the assets of his family because he takes care of a lot of his family i guess and okay. so like he wanted to make sure that she was aware that like if they broke up she had to move out of his house and like she had to like take her shit with her and that his shit was his shit 
and that she wasn't entitled to shit. <laughs> I am an well, actual lawyer. <laughs> that was straight legalese. <laughs> um, well, you know what? I mean, okay. Okay, so. but it doesn't make sense because it you're there's no common law marriage in California. Like there's no reason for this other than just to be like superfluous, like Remember, um, bitch, this shit's mine and your shit is yours. And I guess in the contract, it referred to her as his guest. <laughs> that's funny. That <laughs> That's more insulting to me than the actual contract <laughs> itself. Like, give me 75 pages. Give me 100 pages. That's fine. You keep your shit. I'll keep mine. But like referring to me as your fucking guest. Fuck you. That's where, that's where we draw the line <laughs> in the drama club. <laughs> I didn't realize she was a, a wrestler. Yeah, her aunt and her twin sister. They're the Bella sisters or the Bella twins or some shit. Mm, okay cool are they are people good at wrestling you know or are, are they just yeah, popular no, I think you know so i think they're good at it okay good at faking. i like i like him oh me too he's super funny he's, he's very likable oh. he seems i've heard stories of people you know those reddit stories of people that have met him in real life or like they're alumni of the same college or whatever he seems like a super nice dude yeah not problematic in the slightest mm-hmm yeah just thick necked <laughs> <laughs> he's beefy he's beefy he's but i don't i don't mind it on Gordita him beefy crunch you don't mind beefiness on him i don't mind it on him because i feel like okay he's a wrestler yeah and you he's know like, not like a sex symbol or whatever right yes they're not trying to put him on people's sexiest man you know alive. i like him too because he makes fun of himself oh yeah and i appreciate yeah. that um remember with uh amy schumer in that movie train wreck, wreck and he's like he's like having sex with her and he's like i want to give you my protein <laughs> ew yeah ew uh, no let's um and on that note <laughs> well you don't look much like a girl who's been out having a wonderful evening <laughs> oh here what's the matter dear do you remember when you told me that i might I might have such strong feelings about a boy that it might be hard for me to decide what's right to do. Yes, I remember, but why? It was something like that tonight with Jeff. Bruno, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> that was actually Bruno Mars, everyone. Yeah, Bruno, Bruno Mars, friend of the drama club. Bruno Mars lives with me. He has a leash on. <laughs> May's going to talk about a famous 90s scandal, a presidential-level scandal, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> She's going to talk about Little Miss Monica Lewinsky, and we should give a shout out to our homegirl Diva, who emailed us specifically requesting the scandal. Yes, and you know that when we, um, this is a behind the scenes fact about the drama club, we have a master list of scandals. Yes. And this might have been one of the first ones I wrote down. Oh, so sure. I've been super pumped to do this one. For sure. That master list is kind of ridiculous. It's it's so funny. I look at it sometimes and just laugh. Yeah, because we wrote like cr comments. Yeah, it's like Anna Nicole Smith fucked up life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the tale of uh, Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton. Monica Lewinsky was born in San Francisco, but grew up in Brentwood. Shout out OJ. No, don't shout out OJ. <laughs> and <laughs> Brentwood and Beverly Hills. Whoa. Her mother is Marsha Lewis, who's an author who wrote a gossip book. Hey, drama club. What gossip? <laughs> she wrote a gossip book about the three tenors and a fictional or semi-fictional affair she had with Placido Domingo. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Whoa. Which, I mean, if you're going to fuck one of the three tenors, right? Like, yeah, he's you... probably the one. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> you sure shit aren't gonna fuck? Uh, what's his name? Fat the dead one? Fat um, Albert? <laughs> <laughs> Fat Tony? Uh, uh, Pavarotti. There you go. <laughs> okay. So her father Bernard was born in. If you guess, I will give you five dollars. Fuck Bernard. Mm -hmm. Bernard. Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Wild guess. Monica Lewinsky. Mm -hmm. Greece. Close. 
Her father, Bernard, was born in El Salvador. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? Monica Lewinsky, Salvadorian? Hey! <laughs> Podcast over! I don't need to know anymore. I was always on her side, but now I'm really on her side. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't write down the specifics of it, but it was like his parents were um, Jews escaping persecution in, in Europe and they moved to El Salvador when they were escaping. And he grew up there until he was 14 and then he came to the United States. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> he later became a famous oncologist and an accomplished photographer. Fuck yeah, El Salvador, baby. He's fucking tight, dude. Yeah. Like, he's real cool. Okay, anyway. Monica was in a five-year relationship with her married high school drama teacher. What? Starting from when she was in high school. Oh, shit. How'd you get this info? Okay, good question. I forgot to say it earlier. This I got straight off of the Star Report, a.k.a what they sent to fucking Congress. <gasps> <laughs> so it's going to get real dirty and steamy in here later, but just Ooh. know that if it was good enough to read on the floor of Congress, then it's good enough for the drama club. <laughs> oh, fuck. So I got most of it from that, a little bit from Wikipedia, some of it from her interview with Barbara Walters that she did in 99, oh, okay. and then a little bit of it from an HBO special she did that was like a Q&A type thing okay cool yeah anyway all jokes aside the thing with the married guy yeah that's this, horrible it explains so fucking much yeah and like speaking of that little hbo q a thing it was this thing where monica was sitting on a stage by herself just you know sitting on the floor of the stage and there was an audience and they were asking her questions and shit and one of the audience members says that she went to the same high school as monica <gasps> beverly beverly hills high uh, but is a couple years younger and that this dude was her drama teacher, too. And that she was a victim of his advances, too. Oh, my God. So he tells Monica that she's a victim of this man. She's like, you are a victim. Yeah. And then she tells Monica kind of starts to break down a little bit. And she and the woman in the audience just tells her it's not her fault. And it was actually pretty touching. Oh, my God. That's horrible. So fuck this guy. Yeah. I think his name was Andy. Fuck that fool. Anyway, so Monica worked at the White House first as an intern in the office of Chief of Staff Leon Panetta, and then eventually as an employee from July 1995 to April 1996, starting when she was just 21 years old. So she was like post-college. Yeah, post-college. Okay. She went to some school in Oregon, I think. Okay, cool. Who cares? She, <laughs> she, told, she told friends when she was heading to Washington that she was going to get her quote-unquote presidential knee pads. <laughs> No, so, she didn't. Yes, yeah, she did. Oh. That's in that's in the Star Report. Oh, fuck. <laughs> so we know where her head was at before she even got there. Fuck. Imagine mm. that's your life goal. <laughs> to suck the president's dick. And you did it? Thank you for your <laughs> service. <laughs> America, thank you. <laughs> so a month after her internship started, you Monica people said... People clap, Mon uh, clap when Monica Lewinsky uh, gets off a plane, like for veterans. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I would salute <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Monica Lewinsky is now departing. Okay, anyways. So, a month after her internship started, Monica says that she and the president began intense flirting that she said mostly consisted of eye contact until finally she introduced herself at a public event where the president was greeting staff. She later ran into the president in the West Wing and introduced herself again. And he said that he already knew who she was. Mm. I know. <laughs> and then at this point, she told her aunt that the president seemed attracted to her. Mm. In the fall of 1995... Hey, that's there was gotta a feel really good. What, to tell your aunt? Oh no, that the government is... Uh, that the government is attracted to you? <laughs> The president is attracted to you. The president is attracted to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that feels good as fuck. Yeah. And you got to remember, she's like 21, 22. She's at the peak of her game. Yeah. Her nipples are perky as shit and the <laughs> president's into them. God bless America. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. In the fall of 1995, there was a government shutdown, which led to a lot of White House staff getting furloughed. And a lot of interns doing the work that the staff would usually do. And as a result, 
interacting with officials that they normally wouldn't interact with. And that's how Monica ended up having a lot of FaceTime with the president. Hmm. On the second day of the shutdown, on November 15th, 1995, Monica says that she and the president made eye contact in Leon Panetta's office, and they briefly found themselves alone in the office where she raised her jacket and showed him the straps of her thong underwear, which extended above her pants. What? <laughs> that's, that's her opening move. Oh, fuck. Yo. She's bold Shout out to shit. Monica. Yeah, she's bold as shit. Don't hate the play. I, I couldn't even game. look someone in the eyes until I've known them for like a month. Well, she's had the intense eye contact for at least a month. Damn. <laughs> she needs to teach a class. <laughs> There's a TED talk on. Uh, I don't want to start go down this path. I feel bad. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, America. <laughs> Just for everything. <laughs> <I'm back> to- <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> can you believe that this fucking thong was in the congressional <laughs> report <laughs> you know it's one of those nasty 90s thongs too that are just like the g stream oh, yeah. like and please tell me that there was like a footnote where you would go to that back to the back and it would explain what a thong was it would be like <laughs> Ooh, that dress so scandalous yeah. <laughs> 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 so she told him that she had a crush on him and he asked her if she wanted to see his private office. Lewinsky testified, we talked briefly and sort of acknowledged that there had been a chemistry that was there before and that we were both attracted to each other. And then he asked me if he could kiss me. Lewinsky said yes. <laughs> In the windowless hallway adjacent to the study, they kissed. Before returning to her desk, Monica wrote down her name and telephone number for the president. Later that evening, she returned to the private study, and according to her, she and the president kissed again. Mm. She unbuttoned her jacket. Either she unhooked her bra or he lifted her bra up, and he touched her breasts with his hands and mouth. Whoa. She she testified. (laughs) Do you guys have a boner right now? (laughs) That's what she said to him. (laughs) Um, Unleash the presidential boner. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. She testified, I believe he took a phone call. And so we moved. moved, So we moved from the hallway back into the office. He put his hand down my pants and stimulated me manually in the genital area. While the president continued talking on the phone, oh, geez. Monica understood that the caller was a member of Congress or a senator. She performed oral sex on him. He finished his call and a moment later told her to stop. In her recollection, quote, I told him that I wanted to complete that. And he said that, that he needed to wait until he trusted me more. Oh. And then I think he made a joke that he hadn't had that in a long time. Oh, so that's fucked up. Mm-hmm. Why yeah. you gotta bring Hillary into it? A she didn't say she didn't say specifically Hillary. True. <laughs> Two days later, on November seventeenth, they had another sexual encounter under the guise of Monica bringing the president some pizza. See, I see. That's why I like her. We got pizza now. Pizza thongs, <laughs> sex, <laughs> boners, boners, <laughs> presidential boners. <laughs> Pizza thongs. <laughs> Jesus. They kissed, and the president touched Miss Lewinsky's bare breast with his hands and mouth. At some point, the president had a telephone call. While the president was on the telephone, according to Monica, he unzipped his pants and exposed himself, and she performed oral sex. Again, he stopped her before he ejaculated. That's kind of weird. What? That he keeps stopping her. Oh, yeah, but, well, I guess I guess we get the answer to this later. Okay. Cliffhanger. <laughs> In her 1999 interview with Barbara Walters, which, by the way, made Monica about a million dollars from her cut of the international rights to the interview. Good. Barbara asked her, didn't that make you feel cheap? In reference to the phone call, like the fact that she's going down on him while he's on the phone. Barbara Walters, you're fucking dry ass pussy. You don't know what is making anybody turned on at all. (laughs) See, okay, I learned a lot about this, a lot from this interview, but I really don't like the borderline disgust with which Barbara approached some of these questions. That's why I said that awful thing about her right now, (laughs) because she don't need to be judging Monica Lewinsky about that shit. Monica Lewinsky is a single girl. Granted, 
I don't like anybody getting involved with married people, you know. Right. But I do think it's more so that's the married person's responsibility. Like, you're the one who's supposed to fucking not participate in this kind of shit. Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Like, there's, I would no, never it's condone. Both. It like, is, it's both. But it's more, I think, the fault for of sure. the person who's married. Yes, it is. But, you know, if she's falling in love how do you as a person fall in love with someone who's cheating on their spouse like do you expect them no. to treat you better course, you know I, they're never gonna leave their spouse and they're never gonna right you know, i don't know and if they do like what about the next time some little like exactly you know? that's ugh. there's people who i know who have started relationships based on affairs and they're always looking behind their shoulder like they're yeah. always you know, they're always on top of each other because if you fucking done it for each other, what makes you think that they're not going to fucking do it for someone else? Yep. Yeah. Tristan Thompson, Khloe Kardashian. Exactly. Don't cheat. If you want to be monogamous, be monogamous. If you don't, then fucking break up with them. Yeah. yeah. If you don't, just be a fucking adult. You're not doing anybody any favors. Exactly. Like, tell the fucking truth. I think I'm attracted to someone else. I don't think that I'm set to be monogamous with you right now. Fucking right. Come to terms with like who the fuck you are, put it all out there, and then deal with that shit as an adult. I 100% agree with you. Hell yeah, May. Okay, <laughs> let's get it popping. Barbara Walters, judgy ass. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't like that she asked her the thing like, does that make you feel cheap? Like, no, bitch, that didn't make her feel cheap. She was doing her not. fucking patriotic duty. <laughs> <laughs> You have a man in like the most powerful position doing a powerful thing. Yes. That's what's going to turn her on. And some women are out here giving blowjobs to their boyfriends on the couch while he plays video games. Exactly. She's, or he's, she's on the phone with his fucking debit collector, his credit collector. He's on the phone with someone from Congress. She's giving a blowjob in the Oval Office to the president <laughs> while, while he enacts education reform. This is amazing. <laughs> Show this woman some motherfucking respect. <laughs> But Barbara, Barbara has had some bad looks. I think she tried to out Ricky Martin at some point. Yeah, she has hella bad looks. Their next sexual encounter was on New Year's Eve. Monica was in the pantry of the president's private dining area talking to a butler when the president walked in. She told him her name because she suspected that he had forgotten it because once he'd passed her in a hallway and called her kiddo. <laughs> <laughs> But he replied that he knew her name because he tried to look her up in the phone book after losing her number. Ooh. <laughs> that was old school. Yeah. Had to look her up in the phone book. Yeah. Once again, there was breast fondling and oral sex, but no ejaculation. Bill Clinton is a boob man. <laughs> he loves boobs. <laughs> that <one> loves titties. <laughs> I think um, all presidents should be boob men. Right? <laughs> Until the first female president. Then uh, the first woman president's got to be an ass lady, I think. <laughs> Our country has really done best when uh, the president is a boob man. <laughs> <laughs> From January to March of 1996, they had a few sexual encounters and phone sex. And after the sixth time, had their first lengthy conversation. Sounds to me like they had the perfect relationship. <laughs> On <laughs> <laughs> thongs and pizza first date baby <laughs> half a blowjob and some light fondling second date uh, and that's how I met your mother <laughs> and then <laughs> on February 19th President's Day the president tried to break up with Monica but on March 31st our heroine was back in the Oval Office getting penetrated by a cigar oh shit what that is so concerning. Why? She's going to get an infection. <laughs> Why? Because they're Cuban. I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, the president then put the cigar in his mouth and said, it tastes good. Ew, you <laughs> nasty son of a bitch. <laughs> Mr. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Show him some respect. <laughs> that is so nasty. <laughs> oh my god. I feel like we've been laughing through this whole episode. Because it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's fucking Bill Clinton. <laughs> the president of the United States. Nobody needs to know this much about the president. 
In early April, after people started talking about how Monica was always all up in the West Wing, <laughs> she, <laughs> she was transferred to the Pentagon. <laughs> when she complained to the president, he promised to bring her back after the election. She was devastated. She felt that she was being transferred simply because of her relationship with the president. Well, duh, bitch. Yes. <laughs> And she feared that with the loss of her White House job, quote, I was never going to see the president again. I mean, my relationship with him would be over. Yes. Also, yes. <laughs> After Monica began her Pentagon job on April 16th, 1996, she had no further physical contact with the president for the remainder of the year. She and the president spoke by phone and had phone sex but saw each other only at public functions. Hmm. Monica grew frustrated after the election because the president did not bring her back to work at the White House. Monica would continue to grow increasingly frustrated over her relationship with President Clinton. One friend understood that she complained to the president about not having seen each other privately for months, and he replied, Every day can't be sunshine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would have thrown the phone across the fucking room. <laughs> that's, that's a little too dismissive for my taste. <laughs> But at the same time, he's fucking married. You're the side chick. Yeah, what do you expect? I don't know what right. she was expecting. What did she think? That he was going to quit quit his job, leave his wife, and <laughs> run away with her? <laughs> no, bitch. Every day can't be sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, you know, as the side chick, you're never going to be his number one priority. No. And you should enter the relationship knowing that if you choose to enter that sort of relationship. But not only that, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that his job is kind of demanding, you know? So, <laughs> so on his list of priorities, I'm sure Monica ranked just above playing the saxophone and just below pardoning those turkeys on Thanksgiving. <laughs> in an email to another friend in early 1997, she wrote, I just don't understand what went wrong. What happened? How could he do this to me? Why did he keep up contact with me for so long and now nothing? Now, when we could be together on February 14th, 1997, the Washington Post published a Valentine's Day love note that Miss Winsky had placed. The, ads, <laughs> the ad said, <clears throat> Handsome, with love's light wings, did I o'erperch these walls. For stony limits cannot hold love out. And what love can do, that dares love attempt. Romeo and Juliet, Act 2, Scene 2. Happy Valentine's Day. Signed, M. <laughs> they published that in what? In the Washington Post. Valentine's Day, 1997. Wow. So this is where Monica starts losing me because this is extra as fuck. Yeah, this is where I want to be her friend in real life so I could be like, hey, chill, dude. You're fucking doing too much. I haven't even mentioned that she buys him gifts all the time, like ties what? and shit. Oh my god. I wish I could go back and tell Monica to chill a little bit. Like I'd I'd make her over like Will Smith and Hitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like let's go out for a drink and meet, you know, a single dude. Yeah. Make her unflip the bottom of her hair. Yeah. Uh <laughs> maybe work on flirting that doesn't involve flashing her thong at people. <laughs> no. And that's a solid move. <laughs> She's gotta keep that move. That shit's amazing. <laughs> From now on, that's called the Lewinsky. <laughs> and that shit's Salvadorian, baby. <laughs> on February 28th, Monica wore a navy blue dress from The Gap and went to the White House on Pentagon business, where for the first time in nearly 11 months, wow. she and the president had a sexual encounter. Wow. In the study, according to Monica, the president, quote, started to say something to me and I was pestering him to kiss me because it had been such a long time since we had been alone. The president told her to wait a moment as he had presents for her. As belated Christmas gifts, he gave her a hat pin and a special edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Oh. <laughs> I learned in the Barbara Walters interview that he also gave this book to Hillary when they were young and oh. he was trying to woo her. Oh, no. I don't like that. I don't like that either. No. Barbara asked Monica how she felt about it because she had recently learned that fact as well. Mm -hmm. And Monica said it was kind of bittersweet because, you know, on the one hand, it takes away from how personal it was. But on the other hand, like he only gives this to women that he, you know, feels close to, respects mm -hmm. or something. I guess. Anyway, Monica performed oral sex on the president. She describes the encounter like this. 
I continued to perform oral sex and then he pushed me away, kind of as he always did before he came. And then I stood up and I said, I care about you so much, I don't understand why you won't let me make you come. It's important to me. I mean, I just don't feel complete. It doesn't seem right. Monica testified that she and the president hugged and he said he didn't want to, quote, get addicted to me and he didn't want me to get addicted to him. Hmm. They looked at each other for a moment, then saying that, quote, I don't want to disappoint you. The president consented. Shout out to explicit consent. Um, For the first time, she performed oral sex through completion. On March 29th, they had their final sexual encounter. According to Monica, she and the president had a lengthy conversation that day. He told her that he suspected that a foreign embassy, he did not specify which one, was tapping his telephones, and he proposed cover stories. If ever questioned, she should say that the two of them were just friends. If anyone ever asked about their phone sex, she should say that they knew their calls were being monitored all along and the phone sex was just a put on. Okay. In in early 1997, and for several months, Monica would pressure the president to get her a job at the White House, but no progress seemed to be being made on that front. So Monica started to think that the president was stringing her along. Yes. (laughs) In April or May, the president asked Monica if she told her mom about the intimate relationship. She responded, no, of course not. And (laughs) this is where, if this were Arrested Development, Ron Howard would be like, she did. (laughs) (laughs) And she told six friends and two therapists. Oh, fuck. (laughs) And Linda Tripp, who will enter the story later in a big way. Uh, Barbara Walters was mad at her for telling her friends, which I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I trust, like, you guys, our friends, with, everything you know yeah i would tell you guys i mean i do tell you guys everything so right yeah i would have no qualms about telling you guys about my affair with president obama oh hell no (laughs) and i would be asking all the time (laughs) so apparently monica he asked about monica's mom because apparently monica's mom told someone who told someone who told someone who alerted the president of course on may that's weird that like they were five degrees away from the president. I know, seriously, you know? yeah. On May 24th, according to Monica, she got a call from the president's secretary inviting her to the White House. She arrived wearing a straw hat and the hat pin that the president had given her and bringing gifts for him, including a puzzle. What? <laughs> and the Banana Republic shirt. Oh. <laughs> That's when the president broke up with her. Oh. Imagine getting broken up with while holding a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> How my heart's broken like the like the pieces of this puzzle he it's not you it's me to her and she cried and cried hmm. for, for the next several months monica was thirsty as fuck she'd constantly call the white house sometimes crying pissed that she couldn't talk to the president she tried to bring him gifts and one time his secretary was like yo why don't you go wait in my car and i'll be out in like an hour and we can try to work something out so you can give him whatever you want to give him less conspicuously so monica went out to the car but it was locked and she waited over an hour in the rain oh no she emailed a bunch of people pissed that she still didn't have a job at the white house she also drafted a note to the president pleading for a brief meeting referring to her inability to get in touch with him she wrote Please don't do this to me. I feel disposable, used, and insignificant. I understand your hands are tied, but I want to talk to you and look at some options. She sent him a letter vaguely threatening that she'd tell her parents about the relationship if he didn't get her a job at the White House or at the United Nations. On July 4th, they met in the White House where the president scolded her for threatening him and said it was illegal to threaten the president of the United States. (laughs) (laughs) Quote, He remarked that he wished to have more time for me. And so I said, well, maybe you will have more time in three years. And I was thinking just when he wasn't president, he was going to have more time on his hands. And he said, well, I don't know. I might be alone in three years. And then I said something about us sort of being together. And I think I said, oh, I think we'd make a good team or something like that. And he jokingly said, well, what are we going to do when I'm 75 and I have to pee 25 times a day? And I told him that we'd deal with that. Monica testified that, quote, I left that day sort of emotionally stunned for I just knew he was in love with me. What? Yeah, she's getting 
weird. Is she delirious? Like, he's obviously she, not, right? Is it just me? I think that she's a clinger. And he's probably sending mixed signals. Like, right. that thing about, like, maybe we can grow old together. But, like, maybe he knows that obviously they can't grow old. Uh, you know. Right. Like, maybe it's just a fantasy game that he's playing. And she's starting to believe the fantasy. Yeah. I don't know. The next several months involved more and more Monica being pissed and thirsty about getting a job. In October, during an hour and a half phone call in which she and the president are having a heated argument and yelling at each other, she demands to have a job at the UN by December 1st. When he gets her a job offer at the UN, she said she'd rather have a job in the private sector Jesus. and dem <laughs> and demands that he make it happen. She turns down the UN job offer. What an idiot. This is 100% where she lost me. Yeah. Like, the fuck this moment like what are you doing yeah. you could have had whatever by this time independent counsel kenneth Starr had spent three years investigating president clinton regarding alleged misconduct in an arkansas real estate deal referred to as whitewater yep. that allegedly allowed the clintons to profit illegally this scandal and a bunch of other scandals mostly false or blown out of proportion by political by political enemies had been popping up here and there for most of the Clinton presidency, which at this point was in its first year of his second term. At the same time as all of this, President Clinton is also in the third year of a legal b battle involving a woman named Paula Jones. Yeah. Jones alleged that in 1991, when Clinton was governor of Arkansas, he sexually harassed her. We read all of these fucking lawsuits in law school. Oh, yeah? Yeah, all, like, well, like, hers, and then everything. It why, is it a particularly good example of uh, sexual harassment, it, or it, why? It's how executive office doesn't have uh, immunity to, like, uh, private lawsuits or whatever. It right. It shows, like, okay. the limits of the executive office altogether, because then he also didn't want to testify. He was right. claiming that he had, like, privilege in regards to a lot of this loss, these lawsuits, and then w when everything came out with Monica, also that he was, you know, able to just like kind of like put things off until after his presidency ended. But then, so then the Supreme Court was like, "No, you gotta fucking deal with this now." Or like even right now, there's a big legal question as to whether or not a sitting president can be indicted. Right. I, I just feel like with there, will. there are so many things that are untested these waters are untested yeah, you know never fucking happened before same like with bill like no fucking this had never happened before you know no one's ever gotten a blowjob in the <laughs> Oval office before so um an attorney for jones reached out to linda tripp monica's co-worker at the pentagon after receiving a tip that she might have information that would be helpful to their case linda a fucking two-faced, nosy, attention-seeking rat piece of shit had befriended <laughs> Monica and kept telling her that if she had... See, if Monica had real friends like me and you, we would be like, hey, don't fucking... Don't hang out with Linda. She's she's a fucking snitch. <laughs> yeah, you can tell in her face that she's a snitch. Yeah, she looked like a fucking snitch. <laughs> so she befriended Monica and kept telling her that if and when she got a job in the White House again, she should try to have an affair with the president. She would bring this up all the time. Yeah. Finally, at some point when Monica had been frustrated with the president, Linda brought it up again and Monica spilled the tea about her relationship with the president and why, because of that, she didn't think she would ever make it back to the White House. After this, Linda begins to record their phone calls and she gets Monica to spill more and more tea and details about everything. This leads to Monica getting subpoenaed to testify. She files an affidavit where she denies having an affair with the president. Five days later, Tripp contacts the office of the special counsel and says that she has tapes that prove that the president asked Monica to lie during her testimony in the Jones case. Because the tapes will be inadmissible in court, Starr gets Tripp to wear a wire when she has lunch with Monica the next day at the Ritz-Carlton. There, Monica implies that both she and the president will lie when questioned about their affair. The next day, the FBI swoops up Monica and they interrogate her for 11 hours. Wow. This is when they tell her that she's going to go away for 27 years because it's perjury, perjury, obstruction of justice, justice witness shit. tampering, yeah. fucking everything. Um, how uh, old is she during all of this now? I think she's 24. Oh, my God. She's a baby. Yeah. They want her to admit that she lied and that the president specifically asked her to do so. And they ask her to wear a wire to try to 
figure this out. Mm. But at the end of the day, she refuses and she neither confirms nor denies. I like that. Me too. By this point, the story breaks all over the media and it's the biggest story in the world. Fuck yeah. Monica's face and name are all of a sudden everywhere and she becomes a joke all over the world. That sucks. People call her a tubby temptress Aww. and a portly pepper pot. Oh, <laughs> Barbara Walters asked her specifically how those made her feel. Like, how do you think they made her feel? They made me feel really good, you fucking old bitch. <laughs> that was literally how she opened the interview. She was like, uh, Monica, people call you a tubby temptress and a portly pepper pot and a slut and a stalker and not very bright. How do you feel about this? She was very bright. <laughs> yeah, she was pretty bright. Um, they talked about how oh, she Monica kind of chubby though. <laughs> <laughs> See, if we were friends, we'd, put, we'd say, Monica, how about you cut back on the carbs? Yeah, you know. No. <laughs> you're beautiful. You're beautiful outside and in, obviously. Yeah. Actually, she's pretty. She's really pretty. It's um, just the hair, kind of, right? It's the hair. Yeah. It's the hair. Poor Monica. All right. Okay. In a taped deposition of the president regarding Paula Jones, he has asked if Monica Lewinsky had told someone that they had a sexual relationship, whether or not that would be a lie. He responds, quote, it's certainly not the truth. I've never had sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky. I've never had an affair with her. That's a very sly and I want to say like very attorney mm-hmm. slash politician move to like cut that sentence apart and find one thing that you could break it down with. Well, by all accounts, Bill Clinton is a brilliant attorney. Fuck yeah, he is. They're, he's so smart. He had, there was that one famous quote um, where he's under deposition later and they asked him like, is it true that you had a sexual relationship with Monica Lewinsky? And he says, it depends on what the definition of is, is. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a genius. Yeah, for sure. Um, Monica had been using visits to the president's secretary, Betty Curry for cover. So the president asked Curry, Quote, you were always there when Monica was there, right? And, quote, she came on to me, right? I never touched her. Depending on how you interpret this, it could be obstruction obstruction of justice yeah. if he was asking her to lie. Right. He claims he was just trying to get the facts down. Right. When the story breaks, the White House quickly conducts a poll, and it turns out that if it's true that he had an affair and he asked her to lie about it, then most people would want him to resign. Mm. When told about the poll, the president apparently said, quote, well, we'll just have to win, <laughs> which is like, that's so scary. <laughs> that's some House of Cards shit. That is. That's pretty- <laughs> Start the campaign. <laughs> We're going to win this shit. So th- they decide to keep denying at that point. Uh, but reports start to surface that Monica Lewinsky has physical proof in the form of a semen stained navy blue dress from The Gap. Jones's oh, lawsuit yeah. is <laughs> fucking Linda Tripp. She's the one who spilled the beans about the dress. Fucking bitch. Jones's lawsuit is then dismissed because the den- the then governor's actions did not constitute sexual harassment under Arkansas law. Then the independent counsel gives Monica Lewinsky immunity in return for her testimony. So Monica gives Starr her jizzy dress, and the FBI confirms that it's the president's DNA. Wow. The president then testifies in front of a grand jury and finally admits that he had an inappropriate relationship with Lewinsky, but that it did not include sexual intercourse. Mm. So technically, his earlier testimony during the do- during the Jones deposition was in a strict legal sense true. Yep. That same day, the president officially addresses the American public in a televised broadcast where he basically repeats and explains what he told the grand jury. Mm. The next day, his job approval rating goes up one point to 66%. Whoa. <laughs> they, I was, when I was researching this, it's crazy how popular this man was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People love Well, like him. the economy was killing it. Yeah. He was white, so there was no racism. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He had a great personality. Yeah. He, that was the thing, too. He had good stage presence. He was a great yeah. speech giver. That was one mm-hmm. thing about Hillary that I was always like, fuck, man, like, she didn't give good, like, she wasn't a good stage presence. Yeah, she's kind of robotic. Yeah, that was one thing that I was like, man, if she just had this, fuck, right, to have it all. But really, I want my president to be the smartest person in the room. And I felt like that, what, I mean, I was little, but like, looking back, you know, Clinton. Yeah, me too. I felt like that with Obama. Oh, fuck, yeah. 
Yeah, hopefully one day. Yeah, one day. <laughs> Soon, the special counsel gives his report to Congress where he alleges that the president has committed perjury and obstructed justice. Hmm. The House votes to impeach with over 30 Democrats voting with the GOP. The Senate votes to acquit. The star investigation took six years and cost $70 million. Wow. Linda Tripp was invi- was indicted for illegally recording her calls with Lewinsky. Good. But they ultimately decided not to prosecute. Well, fuck her anyways. Fuck that bitch. She actually had really great plastic surgery, though. I kind of want to know who her doctor is. Hmm. Monica made handbags, turned down an offer of, I tried to buy us one on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny because I bet they're worth something. They're worth a lot. They're worth more than Beanie Babies, tell you that much. Um, <laughs> She turned down an offer of millions to pose for Pet House, hosted a TV dating show called Mr. Personality. Yeah. Have you heard of that? Yes. I remember when that happened. I forgot about that. Yeah. Apparently it was like The Bachelor, but all of the contestants were like wearing masks or something. Yes. So you had to judge them based solely on their personality. Yeah. Fuck that. Obviously you didn't get (laughs) another season. She endorsed Jenny Craig for $1 million dollars. Which required her to lose 40 pounds in six months. By three months, she'd lost 30. But bad publicity from hiring her made Jenny Craig terminate her contract. And they ended up only paying her $300,000. What? Fucking sucks. Um, That's still pretty she good eventually- for three months. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked great. Yeah, sure. <laughs> she lost me. She eventually got her master's in social psychology from the London School of Economics. And she's laid low for the past decade or so. She's done a lot of work to fight online bullying and what she describes as a culture of humiliation. Yeah. And I thought that that was um, that she's a good spokesperson for that. For sure. Because she's like patient zero. Yeah. You know, know? yeah. Like she was dragged all over the place and she just kind of had to take it. Yeah, I feel bad. I feel like she had a million bad looks, but like she was young. I mean, fuck. you know, she made a mistake. So anyway, she even gave a TED talk about uh humiliation yeah and i saw it online bullying that's a really great ted it's talk it's really good imagine giving a ted talk as a direct result of seven blowjobs you gave in the 90s <laughs> <laughs> i love that one chris brown joke that like imagine you're so famous that someone sucks your dick and they become famous <laughs> <laughs> wait chris brown chris rock what did i say i said brown <laughs> Yeah, fuck, my bad. Yeah, dude, Monica was a fucking patriot. She did what she had to do for her country. <laughs> Thank you for your service, Monica. <laughs> yeah, and so that's it. Oh, uh, just uh, afterthought, she she described Bill Clinton as her sexual soulmate. What? Really? Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, you got to have set yourself up for like a lifelong of bad sex after you had sex with the president. Oh, yeah. Well, they didn't have sex. Oh, she blue balls it. it. Is oral sex sex? Ooh. Let's settle it once and for all. Is, is, is? Is, is, <laughs> is, is, is? It depends on what the definition of is, is. Ooh. <laughs> if somebody said that to me in court, I'd be like, fuck you. <laughs> Such a dick. <laughs> Such a dick move. What do you think, like, with the current presidency and, like, all this uh-huh. stuff he's done and scandals and everything how how is it that bill clinton was you know really put through the ringer for this right and like pretty much got was impeached because because the the republican party plays dirty and the democrats are on there we go they go low we go high bullshit which i mean yes i i get that and i that works but maybe it doesn't work in the real world it doesn't work when people are trying to slander you when they're they're pulling out all the stops to try to like handicap you you know yeah i just think like is america different it's not right like we're the same yeah it's just like you know it's bullshit Mm -hmm. i think we pretend to have values or people pretend to have values when it's convenient for them or it benefits them in Mm -hmm. some way Yeah, like look at all these uh, Republicans who were like when the Access Hollywood tape came out, were like, oh, um, I have a daughter and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to vote for someone or I wouldn't want to stand behind someone that does this to talks this way about women. But like the next week they forgot about that shit and they were behind him again. Yeah, that's fucking horrible. 
What about Monica yeah. Lewinsky? Do you think that maybe it, this is something Diva asked us? Like, do we think that she wouldn't have been as dragged if this were to happen now? Mm. Because it like, depends. look at Stormy Daniels. Like, people really back her. Okay, it depends. Does it happen to a regular schmegular white president, or does it happen to Obama? What the blowjob? Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, if it's like a another white president then like they'd be like oh all right like just like stormy daniels like it would be in the news or whatever but no one would be like let's impeach him because of this yeah, or whatever like, start of making fun of her and shit but if it happened to obama, if oh, obama yeah. like they would all hell he would he would have been gone oh yeah <laughs> found a way life finds a way yep <laughs> well i'll say i tip my hat to monica lewinsky because I think she was put into like a really, she put herself in that position also, but then, you know, it really spiraled beyond, I think, anything she had anticipated, obviously. Right. And she did who all right for who, herself. Who could have imagined that it would get as big as it did? Like she, you know, like she was so, we forget how young she yeah, was. And she was really in love. Yeah. <laughs> that, that makes me sad because she's dumb <laughs> for falling in love with him. <laughs> sexual soulmate don't fall in love with married men yeah definitely don't like just stay away like what what are you doing to yourself yeah. <laughs> it depends upon what the meaning of the word is yeah. so next up we've got Steph telling us the beautiful tale of George Michael in a public restroom <laughs> <laughs> All right, George fucking Michael. <laughs> the, the voice of an angel was an English songwriter, <laughs> producer, singer, performer, and philanthropist. Born on June 25th, 1963 in London. His real name is this really beautiful uh, Greek name. And I can't pronounce it, so I'm just going to stick with George Mike. <laughs> um, his father was Greek and his mother was English. He grew up in Kingsbury. And met his fellow Wham bandmate, Andrew Ridgely, in high school. Oh, cool. He started off as a DJ, then started a ska band, and then ultimately formed Wham in 1981. Wow, okay. Yep, their first album from 1983 was a huge hit and skyrocketed him into success at the age of 20. Wow. Yeah. The second album has such club bangers as Careless Whisper, a.k.a. May's Ringtone. Mm -hmm. Wake me up before you go go, and my personal favorite, everything she wants. Oh, that's yeah, that's the best that's wham song, right? Uh, um, I mean, that's my best. Well, oh, Careless Whisper is my favorite, but my second favorite is Everything She Wants. Yeah. Oh, actually, I also like the Christmas song. Oh, Last Whisper. I don't think it's on this album though. Last Christmas. Last Christmas. Last Whisper. <laughs> <laughs> that's a better title. Um, yeah, me and Howell put on everything she wants the other day mm -hmm. after I, I was uh done writing this and we were like dancing and stuff. I was like, This song is so good. Okay, George Michael says that he told his bandmate, uh, Andrew, his homie from high school, that he felt mm -hmm. that he was bisexual right before their first album came out. And okay, then he came out to one of his sisters as bisexual as well, but she cautioned him not to tell their parents. Aww. Um, he ventured into a solo career in 1987. Uh, his first solo album was Faith, and the first single was I Want Your Sex. This is when he was fine as fuck. Yeah, he's really great looking at this time. So this was a pretty controversial song and video back in the day, and it's one of those MTV that MTV videos that they'd only air like during late night programming, yeah. along with like Madonna videos and shit. <laughs> Mm -hmm. apparently some famous vj wouldn't sing the name of the song on air and shit so it was a whole fucking thing fuck that yeah, vj so i wonder who it was um the title song faith was super fucking huge that album won album of the year at the grammys that year wow yeah george michael said that this fame seemed phony to him at the time because he was like an idol and a sex symbol to women all the while mm -hmm. hiding his sexuality Oh, yeah. Um, his second solo album, Listen Without Prejudice, took a more mm -hmm. serious tone, and he sang about social issues and shit. So it was his tu Tupac. His Tupac face. <laughs> it was his Tupacalypse now. Yeah. <laughs> the single Freedom was the second music video to be released from this album. It is iconic. That's the one where he's blowing up the jacket and the jukebox. 
No, that's faith. right. No, where he's blowing up the icons oh. from like the faith video. Yes. Yeah. The okay. song was an ode to his own personal struggles to break out of his musical rut and to get out of his Sony contract. He refused to appear in the music video and instead they got supermodels Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, Christy Turlington, Tatiana Patitz, and Cindy Crawford to appear in and lip sync the song in the place of George. Hell yeah. yeah. That's fucking awesome 90s shit. Yeah. George Michael went on a world tour following the release of this album and its success in 1991. During this tour, while performing in Brazil, he met Anselmo Felipa, who became his secret lover. <laughs> I think this might have been his first gay relationship. Aww. Never like said it that straight out, but he references his first relationship like like it, it you could put two and two together that it was an anselmo and he's brazilian yes okay he was a dress designer Ooh, okay. uh george michael said that falling in love with a man made him realize that he was not bisexual he had been in relationships with women and he thought that he had loved women but falling in love with anselmo made him realize that that was not real love see that's what i was talking to you about in vegas like what if that were to happen <laughs> <laughs> you know okay me uh, <laughs> he didn't immediately release a follow-up album because i'm only saying that cynically because you love men <laughs> i don't mean to like pull apart from that from anybody else who might have that experience i'm just saying my friend may who i've known for over 10 years you're straight bitch <laughs> <laughs> all right well if you say <laughs> <laughs> my attorney says I'm straight. <laughs> oh, God. Depending on what the definition of straight is. <sighs> he didn't immediately release a follow-up album because he was involved in a lawsuit with Sony because record labels, record labels are trash, and we all know that now. Mm -hmm. yep. Also, Michael was very involved with Live Aid concert and AIDS awareness benefits in concerts. He said that he was very scared of AIDS, which was very big at this time it was like the huge epidemic yeah everyone was scared fuck yeah he i fucking read things about aids and i get scared i'm like fuck and it's not even a i'm fucking married <laughs> <laughs> he has said that he had a lot of sex with women in the early wham days but he stopped once the aids epidemic started growing because he didn't want to hurt any women because he was also having sex with men so you know oh, at the yeah. time they didn't know how aids came about they just thought that it was a gay man thing wasn't it called like grid or something it was called the gay plague oh god that's horrible he donated a lot of profits from his singles to aids and hiv and those kind of benefits actually the profits from last christmas went directly to an aids awareness thing oh yeah he famously covered somebody to love at a tribute to fred mercury after his passing Aww. In 1994, he released a song called Jesus to a Child, which was a tribute to his lover Anselmo, who died of AIDS-related complications. No! Yeah. So the first man that he loved he died, AIDS. died. Oh no, George. Six months after he began dating Anselmo, Anselmo found out that he was HIV positive. Oh, Oh. Michael then believed that he probably had the disease at the time and said he was very frightened and felt very alone because he couldn't talk to anybody about it. Because he, he wasn't out. Exactly. And he said yeah. that he all, like really, really wanted to tell his family like, that he was so scared and everything, but they didn't even know he was gay. Oh, fuck. So, okay. he, so he always dedicated the song Jesus to a Child to Anselmo before performing it live. Mm -hmm. And he would dedicate it to his friend Anselmo. Um, George Michael then released Older after having a six year hiatus of bringing out any album. So after Anselmo died, his mom died like within three months. Oh, fuck. He went into a deep depression. And I'll talk about that more later. Okay. So then he released this album, Older, and it was a pretty huge in the UK, like all his other music. And then he released a greatest hits CD in 1998. So Michael's sexual orientation was always speculated about in the media because he was a pretty boy. He was fucking fine. He knew how to put himself yeah. together. And he was also overtly sexual, which was also associated with gay men in the 80s and 90s. And I think even mm -hmm. like in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. So now, now obviously we kind of break away from those stereotypes kind of some right. the right people do <laughs> i would say i would say that his sexuality was given away by the highlights in his hair <laughs> the, the cross earring yeah, one earring and, and the impeccable facial hair yeah for sure <laughs> for sure 
Okay, so now let's get to the business. What I have referred yes. to in this as the business. <laughs> <laughs> On April 7th, 1998, an undercover police officer named Marcelo Rodriguez was a part of a sting operation called Pretty Police. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's offensive. I don't, I do not like it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Officers from the crime suppression unit were making a routine check of the restrooms at Will Rogers Memorial Park after having received complaints in the past few weeks about lewd conduct at that park. Whoop, whoop. Hello with that face too. Pretty. <laughs> The recreational facility is across from the Beverly Hills Hotel at Beverly Drive and Sunset Boulevard. So this is a posh ass fucking park. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is the Beverly Hills episode because uh, the Lewinsky family was from the hills. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, Marcelo Rodriguez followed George Michael into a public restroom at Will Rogers Memorial Park. George Michael has described what went down as a game of, quote, I'll show you mine, you show me yours. Mm -hmm. Apparently, George Michael exposed himself to the officer and engaged in a lewd act while knowingly being watched. Okay. Yep. He was then arrested, fined, and given 80 hours of community service. <laughs> That's too much. So this fucking hit the press. And remember, nobody <laughs> knew he was gay at this time. Right. He speculated, but there was, it had never been confirmed. <laughs> so people went fucking wild. Three days following the incident, 34-year-old George Michael gave an exclusive interview with CNN and came out to the public. Damn. That's so crazy that you had to, like, go on CNN to announce your yeah, sexuality. Isn't that yeah. so fucked up? <laughs> yeah. He said he had kept his sexuality private due to the scrutiny he felt would come with the label. He also yeah. spoke about how he felt very confused for a very long time because he did have a lot of he was attracted to women i think like on the spectrum he's not like 100 percent, you know mm -hmm. and he says that he was sexually attracted to women he had sex with women women had relationships with women right he spoke about how losing his first partner to aids and then losing his mother shortly after took him a very long time to grieve and get over so it's not in his fucking high priority to come out to the you cnn you know mm -hmm. yeah and he was also super vocal about how hiding his sexuality for so long took a very huge toll on his mental health. Obviously, that's why little mm. kids can't fucking handle it. They don't feel support or whatever, you know? There's things they can't talk yeah. about and then they do something horrible, like take their lives. Mm -hmm. They just fucking, it fucking mountains on top of them. And they feel so alone. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, the, the AIDS thing really fucked with me. Like the fact that he thought he might you know, have HIV and stuff, probably went to go get tested and who knows how long things took at that time and like wanted to tell his parents about it, you know? Could you imagine feeling that alone? Right. And then I'm sure that even like, let's say he gets tested and it comes back negative. He's like, it can't be right. I'm like, I must have it. This was my lover and he yeah, died and like just- in your just own fucking head without anybody to calm you down. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah, it's too bad. Okay, so after the arrest, Michael used it as a platform to highlight common prejudices against gay people. He released a song called Outside, which poked fun at the incident, and the video featured Michael as well as other men dressed in police uniform macking on each other at a public restroom. <laughs> that, that video is so fucking good. Yeah. It has like disco balls. Yeah, the public and shit. restroom is guys as a club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So then the undercover officer who arrested him, Marcelo Rodriguez, ended up claiming that this video mocked him and that Michael had slandered him in interviews. So in 1999, he brought a $10 million lawsuit against the singer. Fuck you. Yeah, fuck you. You fucking fuck you. The court dismissed the case and on appeal, it was ruled that Rodriguez, as a public police officer, could not legally recover damages for emotional distress of his job. Uh, <laughs> you know you know who's, uh, who's suing Bob Marley, the deputy from I Shot the Sheriff? <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God>. almost, <laughs> almost 10 years later on july 23rd 2006 michael was again accused of engaging in anonymous public sex this time at london's Hampstead heath and right. after this michael admitted that he liked to cruise for anonymous sex which is very dangerous he was arrested in the same area of london Hampstead heath for possession of a controlled substance in 2008. whoa what kind of controlled substance i couldn't find something that said so he had previously been arrested for drugs once before so the first arrest they said was class a drugs and i looked that up and that's like prescription and like marijuana or something like that 
Okay. But the second time when he got arrested, it was for class A and class C. And class C could be like cocaine and meth are the most common ones. Whoa. Yeah, so okay. Probably coke, you know? Yeah. Um, in 2010, he crashed his car in a storefront while under the influence and was arrested. He pled guilty no. and served four weeks in prison. What? You know, that's fucking crazy, right? Whoa. I feel like I, I never knew know. about that. I know. I didn't. Stuff. That was what? over there. I was in the UK. Damn. Imagine your cellmate is George Michael. Oh, that's awesome. Yo, I would yeah, I would be singing freedom. Okay. All the while, please remember that George Michael continued to support AIDS awareness and he's one of the world's most recognized gay rights activists. Mm -hmm. Sadly, on Christmas 2016, so literally December 25th, 2016, Michael died at his home at age 53. He was very young. Mm -hmm. He was found dead lying in his bed by his partner, Fadi Fawaz. Fawaz stated that I went around there to wake him up and he was just gone lying peacefully in bed we don't know what happened yet everything had been very complicated recently but george was looking forward to christmas and so was i the cause of death was attributed to natural causes as a result of a dilated cardiomyopathy with myocarditis and a fatty liver what does that mm. mean me mm -hmm. tell me that in layman's well, terms uh he had a uh, congestive heart failure What'd you so, say? <laughs> well, when I said, tell me that in layman terms, he said, his heart bad. <laughs> <laughs> he, he died of a broken heart. Aww. <laughs> Last uh, Christmas no, yeah, is probably one of the best, it is one of the best Christmas songs ever. And I remember after he died, I immediately listened to it on repeat like 45 times. Yeah, me too. It's one of the best songs, Christmas or otherwise, ever, yeah. I think. But Christmas is like... Song. Mariah Carey's um fucking mm -hmm. wh what's the name of that fucking song? All I, I want for that, Christmas that. is you. This uh, <laughs> last Christmas and then like Frank Sinatra's cover of Christmas Time is here. Those are like the <laughs> only three Christmas songs that I give a shit about. Um I always listen I don't really care for Christmas music because I worked retail in uh, college and I just can't. <laughs> but I do um well, the Temptations Christmas album is good too actually. I listen to the She and Him Christmas album a lot. Oh, that's very Silver Lake of you. <laughs> <laughs> do you do it with the green juice and <laughs> ro your rollerblading? <laughs> I I I actually just listened to Felipe Esparza's podcast and he interviews Esteban Orio, the photographer, in yeah. his last episode and he's talking to Esteban about like the town in east la where he first shot a bunch of his cholo pics and he's like yeah if you go down there now it's all fucking hipster they got oh yeah he got <laughs> thick frame glasses and vegan wraps and ten dollar cappuccinos and in my head i was like that sounds like my husband <laughs> <laughs> your husband is gentrification yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's george michael i do have as a blurb this is what i wanted to talk about as the quickie maybe fadi fawaz okay all right. Okay. So let's just get right into the quickie then. You like someone, he likes you. Everything is fun and affection. Then all at once, you can find yourself in a situation where your physical urges fight against your reason. Okay. Okay. So at the time of... So we're going to talk about something that happened this week. This is the quickie for this week. But it also corresponds with my George Michael story. So at the time of his death, George Michael was in a relationship with Fadi Fawaz, who had he had been dating since 2012. So roughly four years of dating, right? 2016? Mm -hmm. Wait, 12, yeah. 30, 40, 50, 60. Yes. <laughs> I was counting the wrong 38, 39, 40. <laughs> Fadi is a celebrity hairstylist from Australia who is of Lebanese descent. They live together. Fadi has been involved in a lawsuit with George Michael's family with regard to his portion of the late singer's estate that he believes he's entitled to, apparently. He didn't have a will? He did. Oh, okay. Fadi ain't in it. <laughs> hey. Shortly after Michael's death, Fadi refused to move out of George Michael's $5 million townhouse in London. The house, mm -hmm. as well as most of George Michael's estate, was inherited by his family. And the house itself was left in George Michael's will to one of his sisters. Okay. Fadi wouldn't leave immediately after George Michael's death and tried to argue that he and George had an agreement about his remaining in the house for the, quote, foreseeable future. Whatever the fuck that means. Exactly. So Fadi has constantly accused George Michael's family of cutting him off and not taking care of him since George Michael's death. Who the fuck are you? Yeah. Why the fuck do we got to take care of you? Mm-hmm. 
so let's fast forward now to like right now. He's still living in George Michael's home. Two fucking years have passed. No, not two years. A year and five months have passed. Yeah. No, fuck this guy. And George Michael's family has, they're taking legal action to try to get him the fuck out of there. Like, it's literally in the will to one of his sisters. Mm -hmm. And maybe she just wants to deal with it. Like, I'm not saying maybe she wants to fucking move in. Maybe she just wants to fucking deal with it. Like, go in there, go through her brother's stuff, mourn fucking sell right. it or do it figure out what the fuck she's gonna do you know move on mm -hmm. the longer the student is in here the harder it's her it, it is for her to do all of those things that she needs to do yeah. to get closure yeah for her exactly for her own grief so mm -hmm. then this week on tuesday that's april 16th he went on a glorious twitter rant mm -hmm. do you know it or i have it written here so i can read it yeah i know it but go ahead and read okay. it okay <laughs> so and just so you guys know may screenshotted all of this and tweeted it to me and you were, i think you were like yo <laughs> i had already decided i was gonna do george michael yeah yeah so i got real excited when i saw this because you know i was already listening to george michael like i do every day yeah and so <laughs> i saw this and it came up i was like perfect sending it to Steph. <laughs> okay so he quoted george michael items for sale if you interested please let me know it's a way so i can survive till we solve the problems with his family and lawyer since i'm left with no help and since no one is human anymore yeah fuck you one minute later he tweeted i'm willing to sell any story as well i am done with being respectful towards george michael or the rest if you want to interview me, you know where to find me. I will fight for my right from George Michael until the day I die. What the fuck makes you think you have any sort of a right? The kicker is mm -hmm. coming up. Ready for the kicker? Yeah. He finished it off with a single tweet that said, and no, I won't get a job. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So definitely. Fuck you. Fuck you. Go back to Australia. And get a start, fucking like, job at fucking... fucking what where what is a basic haircutting place super cuts. get a fucking job at super cuts you fucking cunt this guy's balls are gigantic literally this yeah. person like imagine like you're you don't have siblings so <laughs> mm -hmm. but like i imagine like imagine if my brother died how i would fucking feel like i'd be yeah. fucking devastated that's like your best friend and then mm -hmm. like let's just say normal brother and sister your brother who's fucking famous like you gotta feel so like special to be related to him and to have known mm -hmm. him and like an even greater like love and probably an admiration for your brother mm -hmm. now they're gone and you can't fucking deal with that because this fucking little bitch thinks that he has some sort of a right to his estate that's such scoundrel shit because he's squatting yeah he's Fuck that guy squatting. and just for all of us to wrap our heads around the immensity of this between 2006 and 2008, okay, so like past his fucking prime, Michael earned 48.5 million pounds. Wow. That's 97 million US dollars. He's one of the wealthiest British musicians, and his 2015 net worth was over 100 million. And you know what else I know about George Michael? He was one of the people, one of the British people to give the highest percentage of his money to charity. Wow. Or, or something like that. Like he was real generous with fucking everybody and very quietly too. That's perfect. That's awesome. And, and how I'm just going to add this shit tarnish the name of George Michael, you know, like don't drag him through this shit. Let him rest. I'm going to add that I DM'd Fatty Fawaz oh, yeah. <laughs> to try to get a statement for our podcast because uh, we're petty like that. You know, got to hear both sides. I said, <laughs> I said, hi, Fatty. We are sorry for your loss and would like to offer you a platform to tell your story on our podcast if you're interested. Since he said he wanted to tell his story, yeah. I would have paid him three Amer American dollars for that story. <laughs> um, <laughs> I saw him being a bitch because he never responded to him. So to us so fuck yeah. you fatty fuck you and fuck, fuck Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> <laughs> alright so that's this week's drama club <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening as always we're going out with a fuck Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> bye bye however whatever with your helmet